Good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us for Let's Talk Gardens, a webinar series where we invite people to come and address all kinds of gardening issues, uh, design insects, which we'll be talking a bit about today, at least they're one, one part of what's going to be talked about today. Uh, and we just hope that we make you or help make you a more sustainable gardener by the information that we share in our webinar series. My name is Cindy Brown. I am the Collections and Education Manager here at Smithsonian Gardens, and I have the delight to introduce you to Gary Krupnik. Gary is a botanist at the Natural History Museum, and he's going to talk to us about pollinators today in a different viewpoint than what we've had some of our other speakers address in our webinar series. As always, please put your questions in the chat box. We'll be glad to uh, share them with our speaker at the end of the presentation. And Gary, I don't know how long your talk, but hopefully there's a couple minutes left to be able to answer some uh, questions from our audience. And we will also put some hyperlinks in the chat box that Gary will be addressing in his slideshow. And that way you'll be able to have them for your own records and be able to uh, investigate and do more research after this presentation. We do record our presentations and we do put them up on our Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens video library, but it takes about two to three weeks to be able to get the closed captioning uh, done. And if you'd like to be able to, to see this video with closed captioning, please do press the CC button at the bottom of your screen and the closed captioning should appear. Okay, I think that's all the housekeeping, Gary. I think I right. have to tell them where the bathrooms are. <laughs> <laughs> but Gary, it's a delight to have you here. I've worked with you for years. You're based at Natural History Museum. You've helped us so many times with our exhibits and uh, information about what we put in the gardens and what you can find in our gardens too. So I am delighted for you to share this information with our webinar audience and take it away. I'll see and you at the end to ask the questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, screen here and please give me the heads up. Um, if I can if, see it in the slide yeah. view, but not full view. Nope, that's the note view. Uh, okay, just change things around on me. Um, hold on. Why did it do that? It's always fun to see what presenters have in their notes. <laughs> Is that different. good? All right, that's it. You're great. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I just need to do one more swap here. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me uh, talk today. <clears throat> My name is Gary Kropnick. I am the head of the Plant Conservation Unit at Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. I've uh, been here for a bit over 20 years now, and um, my background is in plant pollinator interactions. Um, that's where I, I did my uh, dissertation research. And I focus a lot on the conservation of plants and the conservation of pollinators. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today about is, is seeing the uh, viewpoint of pollination and pollinators from a natural history perspective. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about pollination, which I'm sure almost everyone here most likely knows, um, and talk about the status of pollinators today and, um, and talk more about their decline. Um, I'll uh, give a few uh, case studies, and then I'll give you uh, some pointers of what you yourself can do to help pollinators and the plants that they service. So what is pollination? Um, Many of you have seen pollinators, have seen insects and other animals go to flowers and drink the nectar from those flowers. But what exactly is pollination? Well, it occurs when pollen grains are moved between two flowers of the same species by wind or by an animal, and successful pollination is the result of the production of fertile seeds. And you can see in this video here, this is a hummingbird pollinating a heliconia plant. And what's unique about this is that you can see right there that the pollen grains are actually hitting the forehead of the pollinator. And when it visits another flower, those pollen grains are then deposited upon the stigma of the next flower. 
And so just because an insect might be visiting a flower, pollination doesn't actually happen unless that pollen grain is moved from one species, uh, from one individual flower to another. Almost 90% of flowering plants are animal dependent and our food crops, three quarters of our food crops depend upon animal pollinators. So uh, these animals are very, very important for plant reproduction. Wind is, is quite common as I'm sure you know. Um, and so all, not all plants rely on these animal pollinators. Some use wind and many of you with allergies very much know about uh, this, this type of pollination. Um, these plants include pine trees, grasses and sedges and junipers in which big billows of, of pollen grains of, of dust, pollen dust just get in the air. And, and they produce so much of it because the likelihood of, of a single pollen grain actually landing upon um, a reproductive structure of that of that species is is very small, so they need millions and millions of these pollen grains, and that's why uh, it affects our allergies so so broadly. But I'm going to turn mainly to animal pollination today, and here's a, a beautiful artistic representation of the variety of pollinators that we might see in the world. Um, these animals include birds. I just showed you that hummingbird um, in in the tropics uh, pollinating a heliconia plant. Most likely, uh, most commonly, there are insect pollinators, and there's a wide variety of insects. It's not just bees, but they also include flies, butterflies, moths, beetles, and wasps. And back to the vertebrates, bats are also pollinators, um, and, and you have uh, bats that pollinate a lot of uh, nighttime blooming plants, um, such as agave. And then there are a suite of unusual pollinators that, that don't get talked about too often, um, and they are found throughout the world. Um, in Madagascar, you have lemurs that pollinate uh, traveler palm trees. In Australia, you have honey possums. In New Zealand, there's a gecko that pollinates flowers. And in an island off the coast of Brazil, they've recorded a lizard that pollinates flowers. Um, so there are uh, more, that, more pollinators than just uh, the typical bees birds and bees that, that most of you are familiar with. And so why are these animals going to these plants to begin with? Well, they're getting rewards. Um, most of you most likely know that they're going for nectar or pollen, but some bees and other species uh, collect oils, they collect fragrances, they might collect resins, and some insects actually deposit their eggs in the flowers and they become brood sites for, for, uh, for reproduction. Um, and so it's a win-win situation. It's a mutual re uh, relationship between pollinators and their plants. The plants get reproduction out of it, and the pollinators get a reward. Now, the main reason why I'm talking to you today is because a lot of pollinators are in peril. Um, a 2016 United Nations report estimated that 40% of invertebrate pollinators and 16.5% of vertebrate pollinators are threatened with extinction. Um, and why are they threatened with extinction? Well, there are a variety of threats. Um, habitat loss is the main one. Once you remove land for, for a species, that species can't, can't survive in that space, most likely. Um, habitat fragmentation affects a lot of pollinators and plants. Invasive species, pesticides, diseases, parasites, and global climate changes is impacting all of that and above. Um, and there's that synergistic effect when, when a species is hit by two or three or more threats all at once, it really does impact that population. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and pollinators are really important, not just for the survival of a lot of plants in the wild, but for our own um, food security. Whole Foods did an interesting uh, marketing campaign a few years ago in which they had uh, two photos. Here's the first photo, and it shows the typical uh, grocery store with the produce that you uh, uh, see when you go grocery shopping. And, uh, and it shows, you know, what your typical shopping uh, experience might be like, um, and it shows that these are the choices when there are bees around. If you remove all the bees in the world, your food choices drops drastically. Pollinators are important for food security. Without pollinator, pollinators, we wouldn't have apples. We wouldn't have berries like blueberries or strawberries. We wouldn't have uh, melons or pumpkins. We wouldn't have tomatoes or potatoes. 
And then think about nuts, like almonds or cashews. We wouldn't have those without pollinators. And if you have a sweet tooth like I do, well, chocolate and vanilla are both dependent upon pollinators. Um, if you're a coffee drinker, we'll say goodbye to your coffee. And if you like a little bit of tequila on the side, well, tequila would also go away uh, without the help of pollinators. Um, and so our food security is, is highly dependent upon these, these species. I'm going to talk about uh, two case studies in particular. One is the honeybee and one is the monarch butterfly. And the reason why I'm going to talk about these two is because there's an abundance of data for these two species. Um, many other species of pollinators that I talked about earlier, we, we just don't know enough about, and we don't know why they're disappearing. We don't know how far along they are, are, are going, but we have really good data on honeybees and monarch butterflies. Honeybees is an unusual thing to talk about because they're not native. Uh, the European honeybee was brought to the United States um, uh, over a century ago, and, and they serve a critical role in our uh, food uh, implications for, for agriculture and food security. And monarch butterflies are, are very unique um, species that migrate throughout North America. So first, let me just talk about honeybees. Honeybees have a lot of stressors related to them. Uh, uh, over 10 years ago, there was this, this strange uh, colony collapse disorder. And what was discovered was that there was a multitude of impacts that are stressing out these honeybee populations. And I have uh, them all listed here. Uh, parasites such as mites are attacking, attacking these colonies. Diseases such as funga, fungus, viruses, and bacteria. There's uh, nutrition problems in which there's a lack of forage. There's the, again, once you remove plants from an area, then there's less food for them to eat. Pesticide usage is, is, is really damaging a lot of these honeybees. Uh, mismanaged beekeeper practices have a big impact. And then a lot of these uh, beehives are transported across the country uh, to service uh, various crops uh, when those crops come into bloom. And that transportation is, is a highly uh, stressful uh, experience on these bee colonies. Now, the data I have here to show you, this is a very busy slide, and I just want you to look at that um, red uh, bar in this bar graph. Um, on the bottom, it shows the survey year, so it shows uh, the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years of bee surveys, and on the y-axis is the percent of loss. Now, there's a, a, a typical amount of loss each year you'd expect from a bee colony. Um, so this bee partnership uh, has been surveying beekeepers over the past 15 years to understand how much loss is expected or, or, or ha has been seen each year. And it's, it's, it's a typical die-off each year. Over the entire year, uh, this past year from 2020 to 2021 is the last bit of uh, records we have. Beekeepers in the U.S. lost an estimated 45% of their managed honeybee colonies. And this is the second highest annual loss on record. Um, and it's a six point increase over the average loss rate of 39% over the last 10 years. So 45% loss is much higher than what beekeepers would identify as an acceptable level. Um, in fact, the off, often quoted goal is a 15% loss. Um, and so these losses are, are, are really critical and, and it has a, a huge stress on our own agricultural production uh, when, when these honeybee losses are, are so high. Switching to monarch butterflies, um, let me just tell you a little bit about their natural history. Monarch butterflies migrate throughout North America. Um, in the winter, when the uh, new uh, butterflies emerge, they will then migrate north. Um, and in the springtime, they're in the lower half of the U.S. Um, up in the summertime, they're up in the northern bit of the U.S. and in southern Canada. And then they migrate back down farther south um, for, for wintering. Um, so there's two main populations, the eastern population overwinters in Mexico, and the Western population overwinters in uh, the California coast. And I'm going to talk about each population separately. There have been surveys done um, over the past uh, 15 years for both populations. And the Eastern population here was a measure of the total area occupied by these colonies in Mexico. 
Um, and so again, I have each year shown on the uh, X axis and on the Y axis is the number of hectares that these um, monarch colonies have occupied. Um, in the past year, 2021 20, uh, to 2022, uh, 10 colonies were located last winter season for an area of 2.84 hectares, which is a 35% increase from the previous year, which is really good news. The low point was in 2013-14, uh, when, when it was uh, it looked like they might be going extinct. Um, not sure what, what explains this increase. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the education that we're putting out there to plant uh, uh, milkweed for these, um, for these butterflies. But still, uh, this is a very low number compared to uh, 20 years ago when it was up to almost 20 uh, hectares um, for for these colonies. So it's still quite low, and and each year it varies uh, year to year, as you could see. Uh, the Western population also is slightly rebounding. Um, two years ago, it it was feared that they might have gone extinct. Um, this is uh, a, another busy slide, sorry about that. It's the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count, which happens throughout uh, end of November throughout December. So the new count is still going on, but I have last year's data here. The blue line ignore, that just shows how many um, sites were being monitored. And you can see there's a lot more effort uh, today than, than there were uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but the green line is what I, the green bars is what I want you to look at. And in a surprising and remarkable outcome, this past winter, uh, a year ago, brought a tally of 250,000 monarch butterflies observed across the West, which is a hundredfold increase from the previous year. And I'm not sure if you could see in 2020, but that line just shows 2,000 monarchs. So we went from 2,000 individuals to 250,000 uh, in one year, uh, which was the highest total uh, since 2016. There are many environmental factors uh, that play across uh, this range, so there's no single cause or definite answer for this year, um, but things are hopeful that, that there is still time to protect these species. And, and the more effort that we do to providing resources from these butterflies, the better they'll do. Now I'm going to change gears quite a bit. Um, I work in the botany department at the Natural History Museum in the U.S. National uh, Herbarium, and What's amazing about this is that we have over 5 million plants uh, specimens in our collections, and these specimens can be used in many ways beyond uh, their original intent of taxonomy and systematics. We can use them to understand how climate change and other stressors are impacting plants, which are important for the pollinators. So as I said, here at the Natural History Museum, we have about 5 million plant specimens, um, and that is a huge amount of data. Across the world, there are over 3,400 herbaria, and all those plant specimens combined make up about 400 million plant specimens, which is, again, a huge treasure trove of data. Um, most of these specimens are not readily available online, so they're hard to study unless you're actually there in person to look at them. But that, at the Natural History Museum, we're making great progress in making all these specimens available for study. In fact, we just completed a digitization project in which we've digitized our entire collection of pressed plants. Um, and this totals about a bit over 4 million uh, plant specimens that are now re readily available online. Uh, using this conveyor belt technology, we were able to digitize between 3,000 and 4,000 specimens per day. Um, before this technology came around, we had an individual just photographing plants about 70 a day. So it sped things up tremendously. We were able to finish this project in about five years. And I'm going to put up a link here um, at collections.nmnh.si.edu. Um, you could actually go to that web page and see all, this, um, all these specimens. If you, if you have a favorite plant you want to look at, go to that site and, and you can see all the different specimens that we have in our collection. So all that data is now available to use. And using that data and using these specimens, we can measure the various effects of threats on plant species. Um, there are four different categories here. I'm only gonna end up talking about uh, two of them, but one uh, thing we could uh, measure is changes in distribution. So as we know with climate change, a lot of plant species and animal species are migrating to areas that are cooler if their habitat is changing, if it's warming up. So they might migrate north if they're in the northern hemisphere, 
or they might my, migrate um, up altitude of, of mountains uh, where, where it's much cooler. And so we can measure that distribution if you look at specimen uh, where specimens were collected 100 years ago versus today. We can measure changes in morphology. That is, are they changing shape? Are they change? Are the leaves changing, getting more narrow or getting wider? Are flowers getting larger or smaller due to climate change? We can look at their physiology, what's happening inside the plant. And we can look at phenology, that is the timing of certain life, major life events such as flowering. And so I'm gonna talk about uh, phenology uh, right now. Um, Phenology uh, is the seasonal change of plants and animals, such as insect emergence or migration patterns. But here is flowering data. And a uh, researcher by the name of Panchin et al. Um, and others examined in 2012 flowering records from specimen data in the Philadelphia region to assess changes in flowering responses over time and re in relationship to temp temperature. And they found that these plants are flowering 16 days earlier over the 170 year period. So because springtime is happening earlier uh, in the Northern hemisphere, these plants are blooming earlier. Um, and so that is on average about 2.7 days earlier per one degree Celsius. So as the temperature is getting warmer, they're gonna be flowering earlier. Um, one other example with phenology is a, and, and again, this is using herbarium records, uh, Petrowski and others looked at changes in flowering phenology of two different flowers um, in the central Appalachians. Uh, they looked at cut leaf toothwort, which is cardamine concatenate, and yellow trout lily, which is erythronium americanum. And they looked at the flowering data over 111 years using herbarium data. And they found that both species have significantly advanced their spring flowering over the last century and are blooming earlier than they did historically. And on average, they've advanced their flowering by six days. So this has huge implications for pollination because what if a flower blooms earlier and the insect hasn't emerged yet? There, there's gonna be this mismatch between uh, insect emergence and, and plant flowering. And so that's going to have huge implications on not just pollination, but survival of the insects and, and reproduction of the plant. And then um, I, we also looked at changes in physiology of the plant. And so does global climate change affect the physiology of plants, what's going on within the plant? So working with scientists from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we examined the protein content of pollen grains from historic specimens of Canadian goldenrod dating back from 1842 to the present. And goldenrod was chosen because it is a critical source of nutrition for honeybees and other pollinating insects in the fall months. So these are, are a few specimens that I have shown here and the data that uncovered here um, is, is within this graph. And it shows on average protein concentration from anthers and pollen of 350 goldenrod specimens from the herbarium. And each point in that graph is the average of between six and 40 samples per year from different regions in North America. What we found is that as atmospheric carbon dioxide levels increased, the protein content of the pollen grains decreased. Thus, an increase of carbon dioxide over the last several decades have made a key food source for bees less nutritious than in the past. So think about that. Every single bite of pollen that a bee takes today from a goldenrod is less nutritious than what their great-great-grandparent bee ate years ago, which is just remarkable to think that, that the food source, that the food itself, the quality of the food is changing with global climate change. You know, you, you, you make, you, you start to wonder about the food that you eat, you know, does every bite of apple that you take today, that bite, is that less nutritious than what your great, great grandparent took a bite of years ago? Um, and so quality of food is changing uh, within the plant. And, and these are things that are changing that, that we visually can't see, um, but, but it might have major impacts on the uh, health of these populations. And that's, you know, a further study for a scientist to do is, is to see if nutritional quality affects uh, survival reproduction of these species. 
So this is all lousy, boring, bad news, and um, I'm an optimist at heart. I don't like to think that that all is woe and and things are completely falling apart, because there are things that you can do. There there's things that everyone can do for pollinators. So I have three things listed here, um, which is pretty straightforward. One is to reduce your impact, reduce and eliminate your pesticide usage, and increase your green spaces. And let me just tell you more. Um, if you're spraying for mosquitoes, if you're putting a lot of pesticides and other things down on, on your lawn, you're killing off a lot of insects. Um, it's not, they're not targeted just for, for mosquitoes or, or other bugs. So think twice about each time you use pesticides. Um, it, they really do have a major impact on pollinators. And then increase your green spaces. So second point here is plant for pollinators. So don't just plant those uh, pretty foreign plants, uh, non-native plants in your garden. Plant something that the native pollinators know that they, they, they evolved with. So create pollinator-friendly habitat with native plants that supply pollinators with nectar and pollen. And finally, help science. Watch for pollinators. Get connected with nature. Take a walk and look for pollinators and contribute to citizen science projects. So I'm going to talk about the, the second uh, the second and the third thing here in a bit more detail right now. So a lot of people wonder how, how do they plant for pollinators? Where do they even begin? Um, and uh, you know, I'm talking to a bunch of gardeners, so, so this uh, hopefully isn't too surprising, but, but there are a lot of native plants that are great resources for pollinators. And we have planting guides available to help guide you in your selection of plants. So I'm a member of the North America Pollinator Protection Campaign, which is a, a group of scientists all working together uh, to help solve the pollinator crisis. And a few years ago, I worked with colleagues to produce these eco-regional planting guides. We have 55 guides in total. We have 32 in the United States and 23 for Canada. And these planting guides are specific to each ecological region. They provide a list of plants that will attract pollinators. The table here provides information of sun and soil requirements. It also shows which pollinators typically visit the plants. So you can garden, you could plan your garden to specifically target pollinators that you want to see. And the table also shows which plants serve as host plants so that those plants provide food for the larval stage of the pollinators. So sometimes it's not just the flower that we need to help pollinators, but we need the leaves too because they feed on the leaves. Uh, in the larval stage. And if you don't know uh, which pollinator guide would fit your region, well, it's, it's, it's a great website because you can just type in your zip code and it will tell you which guide that you would need for your region. Um, so these are incredibly helpful. They're in PDF form. You could print them out or just read them online or on your phone, take it to your garden center and, and see if, if any of those plants are available to help you select the right plants for your for your pollinators that you want. And if you want to plant just for hummingbirds, well, you could you could uh, look for just that that um, and, and, and look at those specifically uh, which plants would be best for them. Uh, we have uh, further resources available. Uh, similarly, we have these pollinator garden recipe cards um, and which which provides even more assistance. So like a food recipe card, these cards have a list of ingredients, steps to prepare your dish, and pictures for, your, for the new chefs. So instead of ingredients, these recipe cards have a list of suggested plants that you should be able to find at your local nursery. Instead of cooking directions, these cards provide instructions on how to plant your garden for pollinators. And on the flip side of the card, instead of your meal, you have pictures of the plants that, that you could then add to your garden. Um, they're separated by blooming season. And so it's really important that we provide food for these pollinators year round, or at least from spring until fall. Um, and so we have which ones are the spring blooming plants, which ones bloom in the summer, and which ones bloom in the fall, which is really critical to give food year round because you're helping different pollinators each season. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so there are nine car, nine regions, nine, nine recipe cards available uh, within the U.S., and we're currently uh, making more uh, coming soon, and they are all available to download um, at pollinator.org slash garden cards. So again, these are PDFs. So you can print them out. You can have them on, on your phone. And let me go back a slide here. 
um, it gives you first options and second options. So if the first option isn't available, you could go to the second option and, and get a very similar looking type of plant. Um, it shows uh, the colors that the plants are, uh, uh, but flower color is available. So you could uh, 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 plan your garden accordingly if you want a certain color thing. Okay. Um, so now that people have been planting gardens and helping these pollinators, and we've seen that, that even the monarchs are slowly bouncing back because we're providing the right food resources to them, we're trying to get a record of how many pollinator gardens there are in the United States. So with all these tools in hand, the Smithsonian teamed with our partners to launch the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. And this challenge is a nationwide call to action to preserve and create gardens and landscapes that will help revive the health of pollinators across the US and by just registering your garden online. And so registering is easy, the garden can be one in your backyard, it could be a garden planted at a school, and it could be even a, a garden on either your corporate landscape or at, at places of worship. Any of these gardens can count as a pollinator garden registered on this map. When we launched this plan, we had a, 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 a three-year plan to get a million pollinator gardens challenged, and we reached that goal and surpassed it. So that million pollinator garden challenge, we now have over a million and what is that 58,000 pollinator gardens registered on this site. Um, each, each green dot on that map represents a new habitat for pollinators. I um, mean, you could zoom in and you could see where these pollinator gardens are. You could be listed anonymously or, or you could um, share the information about your garden for others to learn uh, from you. Um, and what's amazing about this is that um, this was launched in the United States, and yet it's taken off worldwide. So if you zoom out and see the rest of the uh, the world here, you could see that people in South America, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in Australia have all registered gardens on, on this site, which is just really exciting to see the proliferation of gardens uh, spreading across our world, um, all helping pollinators. So next I'm going to talk about Do these pollinator gardens actually work? Um, as a scientist, I know we're, we're telling people to plant native plants uh, to help these pollinators, but what pollinators are we actually helping? Which ones are we targeting? Which ones are being left behind? And, and that requires some uh, serious science. And that is where another way that you as a citizen can help us. So we launched Pollination DC a uh, year ago. Um, and this is a ongoing citizen science project, which is very easy to participate. Um, this is uh, mainly with, with the name DC in there, it's mainly targeted for the Washington DC area, but we have hopes in the future to expand this uh, to other cities throughout uh, the United States. And the idea is for those who work in community gardens in their city to keep a lookout for pollinators take out your phone and take a picture of that pollinator when you see a pollinator on one of the plants in your community garden. And then you could take that picture and upload it to iNaturalist. And here's our website on iNaturalist. Um, and record that information. Um, and then scientists on the site will help you identify those species. And we could have then clear observations of what pollinators are visiting which gardens. So it's it's a fantastic project. It takes place in community gardens, which are very easy, uh, recordable areas for us to work with. Um, in the Washington, D.C. area, there are 35 community gardens across all eight wards in the district. Uh, here's a picture of the Southwest Community Garden, which is just one of the 35 gardens. And we understand that a lot of these community gardens, people are planting uh, vegetable plants. Uh, for food, but we're also hoping that they're planting native plants to help attract pollinators. And we're trying to um, send the message that when you plant native plants, they'll attract pollinators that are then available to help pollinate your food plants. Um, and so it, it all works well together. iNaturalist is very easy to use. Um, it is a program that helps us record this information. If you don't have iNaturalist, it's easy to go to their website, just Google iNaturalist, 
and create an account. Um, once you have an account made, you can then upload pictures of animals, of plants, of fungi, um, any of those species uh, to have your own uh, list of species that you've come across. Um, but uh, please help us with the pollinators and, and the flowers that you upload. Um, once you upload the photo, the app will identify the date and observation and locality um, of your observation. And you could then type in the name of the organism that, that you took a photo of. And if you don't know what species it is, well, iNaturalist will then provide suggestions based upon the image and the location. So for this instance here, I uploaded this beautiful blue flowered plant I saw a year ago in uh, Great Falls, Virginia. And it just happened to be the uh, Virginia bluebells and uh, the iNaturalist app quickly identified it as Virginia bluebells. So, um, so it's really easy. It, it has great uh, photo recognition, will then help you identify the species at hand. So here is a web page of that Southwest Community Garden that I showed earlier. Um, when you upload your photos to iNaturalist, you can also see what others have uploaded um, and see which pollinators have been digitally captured within that garden. So it's a fantastic record of what's been visiting that garden and what plants are actually in the garden as well. So in essence, you're creating a photo journal, of some of the wildlife visiting and living in the garden. We're going to use that data and compare it to what's visiting the uh, pollinator garden at the Natural History Museum. So we also have people taking photos at the Natural History Museum and at the U.S. Botanic Garden. We'll then be able to determine which pollinators are benefiting from both community gardens and native plant gardens. And we could then use that information to help make further recommendations in the future of what plants are, are most beneficial to certain threatened uh, pollinator species. If you don't live in DC or if you don't work in community gardens, don't fret. You could still take pictures of plants and animals in your own backyard or at your school or at uh, the places that you work. And you could participate each year in what is called the City Nature Challenge. So right here, I have the dates for next year's City Nature Challenge in Washington, D.C. Excuse me. It's a friendly worldwide competition in which metro areas are competing to see how many residents can spat, uh, spot the most wildlife within their region. And so it's looking at urban, uh, urban ecology. So we ask fellow nature enthusiasts to visit local parks, neighborhoods, backyards to see what plants and animals share the environment that we live in. Um, and so next year, the DC City Nature Challenge will run from April 28th to May 1st. Um, and it's free to participate. Everyone in the metropolitan area with an access to camera can, and an internet can join the fun. Uh, and again, it's really easy to participate. Again, find any wildlife, whether it's a plant, animal, or fungus, or even a slime mold, or any evidence of life, whether you see scat or fur or tracks or shells um, in the DC area, take a picture of what you find, share your observation to iNaturalist. Uh, in this case, DC is, is not just the city, but it's the whole region around Washington, DC. Um, so if you live in any of the participating counties surrounding DC on this map, your observation would count. And so again, participate during the last week of April and early May. Um, and if you don't live in DC, you could participate in the city where you're at. In fact, last year, um, there are all these green dots are all different cities throughout the world that were participating in the City Nature Challenge. Uh, again, it's a friendly competition to see which cities can have the most uh, action activity uh, in terms of taking pictures and getting participants to play. Um, and I think this map here, oh yes, 487 cities participated last year. And if you want to see how uh, Washington DC did or any of the cities that you're from did uh, in this challenge, well, here are the top 10 um, of the City Nature Challenge of last year. Um, and exciting to say in terms of number of people, Washington DC came in second place. Um, I'm not sure what's going on in, in La Piz, uh, Bolivia, but good job. They're, they're, they doubled the amount we have um, and compared to any other city in the world. Um, but yeah, we, we did great, second place. Um, this whole challenge started in San Francisco, 
uh, California, and they've been number one for years on end. Um, and so it's, it's great to see that we've had such high participation. If you look at the number of observations, we came in fifth place. That is how many photographs were uploaded to iNaturalist. And then if you look at the number of species recorded, we came in seventh place, uh, which is, again, uh, puts us in the top 10, uh, along with all these other cities. So again, it's a fantastic uh, 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 way to, to get a lot of participation. Um, finally, I just want to add one last thing, um, which is uh, the role that art and science can play in education and research. Um, so again, the North America Pollinator Protection Campaign, which I'm the uh, vice chair of the steering committee, works with the uh, nonprofit Pollinator Partnership to produce these educational posters uh, for Pollinator Week each year. And there's a post, a different poster each year. And the first set of posters that were made about 20 years ago were a great introduction, a great introductory tool to bring attention to what pollinators are and why they are important in maintaining habitats, ecosystems, and uh, our own food security. And they uh, showcased uh, different themes each year, and they are sent then to school groups and educational groups throughout North America. In 2012, the posters took a new direction. Um, we began to focus on specific themes to look at specific plant-animal interactions. So in the uh, top left there, the 2012 poster was called Pollinator Pathways, and it examined four migratory species, uh, a bat species, two hummingbird species, and a monarch butterfly, and it featured 12 different plant species that are pollinated by these four animals. Um, in 2014, um, I signed on as the scientific advisor for these, for these posters, and we focused specifically on orchids, orchid species and the pollinators that visit them. We highlighted seven different plant animal interactions native to Canada, the US and Mexico. And um, it highlighted interesting interactions that might usually go unnoticed by the general public. So for instance, if you look at that center flower in the orchid poster there, um, it's a Canadian orchid called the blunt-leaved orchid, Plutanthera obtusata, and it's pollinated by a mosquito. So a lot of you probably didn't realize that mosquitoes can act as pollinators too. Um, other posters over the years include a poster called They Don't Eat Their Pollinators, which is all about how carnivorous plants um, separate their animal traps from their pollinators. A poster called Trees for Bees, which focused on the importance of tree species as important food sources for pollinators. Endangered pollinators and their habitats provided information on 22 endangered pollinators and the plants that they depend upon. And this year's poster was Wings of Life, which featured butterflies and moths and the essential role that they play in pollinator service, uh, pollination culture, and ecosystem service. And just one really interesting side note, and this is why I brought these po posters to attention, is that if you go back and look at this um, carnivorous plant poster, we always want to get the science correct on all these posters. We want to have the correct pollinator identified for the right plant. Um, and so when this poster was produced, the carnivorous plant poster, it was noted that there was not a single published study on what pollinates the Venus flytrap in the wild. Now think about it. the Venus flytrap is one of the most well-known carnivorous plants. And we know all about its carnivory, how it traps flies, uh, with that trigger mechanism. But surprisingly, and I dug through the research and I spent weeks on end looking for any recorded paper about what pollinates the Venus flytrap in the wild. And there was not one published study. Most of them just said bees and flies visit the flowers, but nothing identified which bee or which fly or which insect pollinated Venus flytraps in the wild. So when we came out with this poster, we had the Venus flytrap because we had to include Venus flytraps in a carnivorous plant poster, but we didn't include any pollinators uh, pollinating the species. We have pollinators for, for uh, pitcher plants and other carnivorous plants, but none for the Venus flytrap. What's interesting is that after we released this poster, a couple years later, a professor in North Carolina took his students out and conducted a study in North Carolina where Venus flytraps grow um, naturally. 
and they found a sweat uh, a sweat bee and two beetle species as confirmed pollinators for the Venus flytrap. So now we could say that these posters actually lead to interesting scientific studies and discoveries, and I'm really excited uh, about that, that these posters can actually help that. So, um, so yeah, so the intersection of, of art and science uh, is, is truly unique and something that I, I'm very happy in participating. So I see um, I'm at about a quarter till one here on the East Coast. So I'm going to end my talk right now. I want to thank you very much. Um, and I want to encourage you to participate in Pollination DC. And if you're not in DC, uh, par participate in a Citywide Challenge and go out and take photos of those pollinators in your gardens. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. That was terrific. Um, as you can see, we have, have two of the posters behind me that relate to our collection, the orchid collection and the tree collection. Uh, so we are very proud to help out with this advancement of knowledge of pollinators and plants that go along with it, uh, which, which is great fun. Uh, there are a number of questions I'd like to ask you, see what I can squeeze in before we have to leave. One, I want everyone to know they can also get posters from Smithsonian Gardens. We have free posters on our website and they are posters that relate to the pollinator garden, which is on the east, yes, on the east side of Natural History Museum. And that's a garden that we're very proud of because not only is it introducing pollinators to people that come to our gardens, but it introduces pollinators to gardens all over the United States that have taken advantage of our offer of free posters. Uh, you can download them for free from our website and you can find them, uh, pollination gardens that are using those posters within the United States and also overseas. We have some in Slovenia and some in uh, Croatia and a couple other uh, gardens over uh, in, in Europe in different areas. So that was one of the things I, so if you're interested in more uh, posters to be able to get for free, to be able to use for your education programs, please feel free to go on our website and uh, see what you can find about pollinators as well as um, activities that you can do with your students too. So one thing that I, we get asked time and time again, okay, what really are native plants? What do you consider native plants? Everybody's always concerned about native plants versus cultivars versus hybrids. And are they just as uh, equally attractive to pollinators as the straight species are? So I have some answers, but go ahead. I yeah, want to so so you my know. best understanding would be that a native plant is the an, an uh, individual species that evolved in its original location. Um, and so you have various regions where, where plants have evolved over, over millennia before humans came about. And that's what a native plant species is, not one that we imported from a different region. So you have a lot of species in gardens that might be from Africa or Asia that are planted in the United States, and those would be non-native. Even if you pulled a plant from California and tried to plant in Maryland, it would be considered a non-native species. Um, difference between native plants and cultivars is that sometimes plants are bred specifically using artificial selection to increase its its beauty for the garden. And a lot of the times when when it's 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 bred cultivated over time, it might lose its nectar or it might have too many petals and not look the way that a pollinator you would usually see it. So a native plant is is usually a, a, a lot better than planting a cultivated uh, variety of, of a species. And, and that that's how I would answer that. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, we haven't found very many studies that are really looking at to see what is being bred out of plants when they're turned into cultivars. And so our advice is to look at the plant that you're using. Is it still producing pollen? Is it still in the flower? Is it, or is, or is the flower a sterile flower? No pollen is being produced anymore. So you're gonna to have to do some investigation as a gardener to be able to determine, is that cultivar one that actually has uh, something that is available to the uh, pollinators? And what we have found, there has been a study on uh, variegated leaves. And evidently, plants with variegated leaves, natives, cultivars, whatever, and mostly it'd be cultivars, are not as attractive to pollinators as a plant that has straight 
it's normal color. It's not say normal, although there is no such thing as normal, uh, but normal color. And how this subject gets even more interesting is with climate change. And you've already said that climate change is affecting the amount of protein that may be in pollen. Well, it also affects what is native to an area. So as we get warmer, just like it has happened all through millennia, uh, plants do move, naturally move. So what started up, Southern Magnolia started out being native to further south, and now it's native to uh, Virginia. So it's a, it's a big question, a lot of moving parts to it. And so just, just look at it. I also like to use cultivars at times because I'm trying to convince other people to plant things in their garden that are native. So sometimes uh, cultivars may be a little bit prettier, as you said, but um, look at that plant before you put it in. Look to see it. So another question I really want to know too, how do you know that there's a decrease in protein levels in goldenrod pollen with increasing atmospheric CO2? And do you know why? So what happens is that when, when there's higher CO2, um, the plants are just growing differently. They might be growing faster. They might be growing... They might be uptaking nutrients differently from the soil. Um, we just don't know enough about that physiology, but we do know that that the protein decreases is due to carbon nitrogen ratio. Um, and so plants are increasing the amount of carbon in the plant because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. And when you increase one uh, component, you have to decrease the other component. Um, so if you're increasing carbon, you're going to have to decrease nitrogen. Um, and by decreasing nitrogen means there's less protein because nitrogen is, is or protein is primarily nitrogen based. Um, and that's why there's less protein available in the pollen. Cool. All right. Thanks. Here's an easy one. What's the difference between nectar and pollen? Nectar and pollen. So pollen yeah. is the reproductive structure. Pollen is, is if, if uh, you don't mind my comparison to humans, it's it's the sperm of the plant. It, it's the male component of the plant that that is then uh, used to fertilize the egg uh, within a plant flower and in the ovule of the plant. Nectar is, is just that reward that's available. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the plants are producing a, a liquid, a sugary liquid uh, within a flower as a reward. It has no other purpose other than to attract pollinators. It all goes back to that co-evolution of plants and insects, which I find yeah. so fascinating. Yeah, one is just a reward. So it's a treat for being able to help out with the pollination. Yeah, yeah a lot of the bees though, I mean, that that pro that, that, that pollen grain um, that is used as a reproductive structure, they actually use that as food. So it, it's, it's very nutritious. Um, and so, those pollen grains, um, um, unfortunately, you know, it's it's meant to get to a flower, but but a lot of bees actually use it to feed their young, um, and so um, it, it and that's why plants have to produce so many pollen grains because only a few will actually reach their target. Okay, what's the difference between the green dots and the brown dots on the registered pollinator sites? I was afraid someone was going to answer that. <laughs> I, 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 those brown dots appeared um, last year, and I haven't reached out to the map makers to ask why. Um, the green dots are specifically those that are registered sites. Okay. Um, I can't click on the brown dots, and I need to ask the makers of that. Um, so I apologize. Um, that's just one snafu that that I, I just saw the other day. Okay. And then some things happen beyond our control. Maybe it's it's <laughs> public gardens compared to private gardens. Which that's is what uh, that's my 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 yeah. guess is that yeah. it's the difference between public and private. I agree. Okay, here's one because we all know that fungicides and pesticides are equally um, deadly to different creatures. Um, there is a little bit difference in the formulas. How would you describe a fungicide compared to a pesticide? Um, so yeah, they're uh, affecting different species. Um, I, I am not a, a, a pesticide specialist. Um, you know, that, that are, those are my colleagues over at EPA who uh, do a lot of work with them, so they could probably answer better. Um, I, I wouldn't know exactly how to answer that, so I'm going to pass on okay, that. I have my pesticide recertification my, or, or, you know, license that I can spray. I don't do it, but uh, how we describe it is pesticide all categories, insecticides, all that fall underneath the pesticide because it's all something that you use aside as something that kills, uh, just the, in, in 
I guess it's Latin. I don't know if it's Latin or Greek. Right, right. So, yeah. So, pesticide it includes insecticide, includes right. fungicide, includes herbicide. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, pesticide is a general term, but yeah. Right. Yeah. But fungicide is only going to affect funguses, although it's, it's, uh, it's like taking a medication. Some side effects occur uh, and not just killing the funguses. It might also damage uh, the insects or the pollinators that are coming along. So best advice, don't use them unless you absolutely have to. I mean, we've even seen that herbicides affect humans oh, yeah. when you use Roundup, you know, that, that, that affects. Right. So even though it's targeting plants as an herbicide, um, it affects all other species as well. So right. that's why all these poisons that we put out in the, in, in their landscape has, has implications for more than what you're just targeting. Right. So as homeowners, what do we do when we get an infestation of something like the spotted lantern fly that, you know, I don't want to spray anything. I'm just going to go out there and squish things by hand. I don't know about you. Right. There are so many different green remedies out there that you just need to search for to control from it, mosquitoes. I, I've seen many different home remedies to attract mosquitoes and kill them without putting out poisons. Um, I, I, I just... Google is friendly, you know, just go ahead and Google uh, various home, homemade solutions to, to, to kill what you want to kill without harming others. Yeah, my foot is very effective in taking care of some of that. And it flies water. Uh, you know, so think about using uh, physical um, alternatives instead of a chemical uh, yeah. alternative. Like that, that's what I, I'd like to advise for anyway. So I'm now looking. Um, why is common milkweed your first option on your recipe card rather than the butterfly weed? Because common milk, milkweed, I don't know if you've ever planted it in your garden, but it can take over very quickly. Um, both natives, so it's not an invasive, it's just a native right. that's very happy. <laughs> so if you're really wanting, you know, monarchs was, was one thing I talked about. Um, the monarch uh, larvae, the caterpillar of a monarch, only feeds on milkweed. There's no other plant on the planet that the caterpillar will feed upon. And so without milkweeds, we would lose our monarch species. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There's a good question though. Are we potentially hurting monarchs with planting tropicals? And I don't know if they- So mean it, 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 there, there've been a study and do not right. Plant the tropical milkweed right. because that tropical milkweed is blooms much longer throughout the year, and it, then it, it 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 discourages the monarch from migrating it, because that food source is still there all the time. Um, and so, again, find the monarchs uh, the, the the milkweed species that's native to your region to your state. There's there's different there's many different uh, species of of milkweed. Find the one that's native to your region and plant that one. Don't plant the the, the general, uh, the tropical one. Um, those right. tropical ones should stay in the tropics. <laughs> right. Get some good books out there or go on your native plant societies and find out what they're recommending because it does make a difference. I'm always amazed when I travel and I hike and I see uh, genera that I recognize, but then I'm going, what in the world is, you know, species is that? So you know that there's multiple plants that will thrive in different environments that you live in that are going to be great for pollinators. So one question I'd love to address is, and Gary, you can help me out because I know you've seen a change in the years that you worked here at Natural History at the Smithsonian. How Smithsonian Gardens moving to use more native plants and less um, uh, decorative plants, I would say that way. And I don't know if the, the audience knows, but Smithsonian Gardens, we are a museum, and each one of our gardens relates to the museum that it is surrounding. So we have a mission to be able to tell stories through plants, through gardens, uh, whatever is in occurring in that, in that museum. So that is part of our, our mission. And so one of the best places to find native plants, of course, is around natural history, because that ties in with you so much. I don't know how you feel about the changes that you've seen. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I started here, um, so the Smithsonian, or the Natural History Museum, um, Smithsonian Gardens has two interesting gardens. There's the pollinator habitat and then the urban bird habitat. Mm -hmm. um, I was around when the urban bird habitat was just a grass lawn. Mm -hmm. um, and we decided, okay, let's get rid of this lawn and plant plants for birds. 
Um, and so I was heavily involved in the creation of, the, of that garden, which was just so fun to see that that green grass going away and all these plants just coming in. Um, yeah. And yeah, and and so I have no problem with with these exotic plants in botanic gardens where it's controlled and they don't plant invasives and they they know how to prevent it from escaping uh, because botanic gardens educate the world about right. about plants from around the world. So so it's important to have plants from from around. Um, if you're planting your own garden in your backyard, though, you don't, you're not educating any any visitors about plants from around the world. You're you're planting it; it's it's part of nature, and you want to help the the native plant, the native animals that are in your region. And so the best way to do that is with native plants. Agreed. And we've even taken the lawn, and Gary, I haven't talked about to you about this as much. The lawn that's on the north. East corner is now the bee lawn, a pollinator lawn. Oh, fantastic. And I'm working with an entomologist to be able to look to see which of those plants are drawing a lot of pollinators. So we're, I'm going to talk to you soon. I'll be over in your office Great. probably after the holidays. To yeah, be I mean, even my lawn in my front yard, I, I do have a lawn. Um, you know, I would love to get rid of all the lawns, but I do have a lawn and, but we don't, we don't treat it at all. We just let the grass grow and along that grass are, are, uh, are, um, uh, uh, clovers and um, and dandelions, and while no, neither are, are, are native, both provide great food resources for bees. Um, right. And so, I mean, you, when those clover come up, those bees go crazy for it. Yeah. So, yeah. so when we get more information that we want to share, scientific information, we'll have a program. Uh, Let's talk gardens on bee lawns, and and we'll include you in that too. Oh, excellent! But I would love to hear. I want to thank you uh, for helping us out, learning more about pollinators and the importance of the herbarium. I think that's a really cool uh, resource that natural history has, and it's all digitized now, so people can see all those bazillions of bumblebees that you have in your collection, as well as the plants in the herbarium. So yeah. what great fun. So thank you all. Uh, next week, we're going to have a Christmas tree geneticist, which I'm really excited. I never thought about studying Fraser firs to see the effects of climate change on Christmas trees. <laughs> so you're going to learn more about that if you turn in uh, uh, next week. But thanks to all for coming. I appreciate it. And thanks again, Gary, for your help. I appreciate it greatly. Thanks for having me. Okay. See you, everyone. Bye -bye.